Hello, welcome to I Think You Think. Today is August 14th, and you are listening to I Think You Think. I can never get this right. A podcast that puts a new spin on debate and discussion. I'm Justin. On the other side of my computer screen is James. Howdy, folks. And Sequoia. Hi. And we are your hosts. We carry no credentials worth noting. There we are. I am here. Uh, I Think You Think is a podcast focuses on what we, your hosts, think, but also what you think. Too many times we spend debates and discussions talking past one another, not enough time trying to learn and understand why someone thinks what they think. This is what makes I Think You Think different, because we are focused on what people, on why people think the way that they do and why we think the way that we do. James and I and Sequoia believe that the forum of ideas should be open to everyone, and everyone should have the opportunity to challenge and be challenged by ideas. We are not here to pass judgment, but merely discuss ideas and topics. This podcast, first and foremost, is a conversation between us and hopefully you. Feel free to email us, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and at the Chicago Now blogs. The links for each of these can be found in the underbar of the video or at facebook.com slash ithink.youthink, chicagonow.com slash i-think-u-think, or on Twitter at ithink underscore youthink. I Think You Think is produced by Stolen Arts Productions and is recorded live at Fisher International Studios. How is everybody doing this evening? I'm good. Today was my first day back to work after vacation, so I'm as good as I can be, given the circumstances. Sequoia? I'm pretty good. I had two days off in a row. I'm actually feeling a lot less hostile, so that's good. <laughs> I need my the blue thing. My the blue thing is here. Hello. Um, I am on day the end of day one of two days off, and I had to work yesterday, but I had two days off before that, so I'm on a nice little stint of time off. And I just uh, reserved our hotel uh, one night, but we are going to visit my family in Ohio in September. We are? Uh, all of Did us, you know yes, about this, everyone. It's an I think you think trip. It is an I think you think trip. Nice. Well, I guess while I'm gone, we'll do I think you think, but I will be doing it not at the Fisher International Studios, but uh, the um, a satellite studio. <laughs> and by satellite studio, I mean someone else's dining room and or living room and or someone's bedroom, I guess. I don't know. It depends on where I'm at really. Um, but I booked that hotel. We are traveling down to southern Ohio uh, because ever since I was like in fourth or fifth grade and I learned about the uh, Indian burial mounds uh, in southern Ohio, I've always wanted to visit them and I've never gotten to. And so we are going to visit one of the most famous and oldest uh, Indian burial, well, oldest burial mounds in the world, uh, the uh, um, Serpent Mound in Southern Ohio. So we're going to go visit that. Neat. So I'm looking forward to that. And then we're going to spend time with my family and we're going to go to Cedar Point um, and um, and then come home. So there you go. Nice. It is indeed. So what has been taking up everybody's time recently? Actually, um, so as you may have known from the title, we're going to be talking about tech that we can live without. And the uh, show, the mini I assume they're going to do it as a mini series like they had done previously. They are redoing the Cosmos series that uh, my personal hero, Carl Sagan, did uh, back in the, I want to say 70s or 80s. It was, it was a, a ways ago, 79, maybe early 80s. Um, but I saw James jump forward, so he's probably looking that up as I speak. Um, but Carl's, uh, but the Cosmos is being done again, and this it's being done uh, with um, Sequoia. Help me, I can't think of his name right now. Carl Sagan? No. No, he's dead. Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh, that, would, that would be some serious, <laughs> serious science right there. I actually don't uh, know. Neil, Neil deGrasse Tyson. I could not oh. remember... That is, yeah. that is correct, sir. But I love him as much because he, like Carl Sagan, uh, has that, that just that teacher's spirit. He really is excited about science. He's excited about what science can do for us. Um, and so he uh, really has that great spirit. 
we will be talking about that a little later, and I will be sharing my feelings. I just recently watched the trailer for it, and we'll talk about that. So, uh, things going on and uh, in people's lives. Sequoia, go ahead. Uh, I don't know. I've actually had quite a bit of time off lately, but I've been doing a lot of like big social stuff. Uh, but in the last like two days, what's been taking up my life is studying, 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 studying. So, doing a lot of studying. <laughs> and since your study, since you study anthropology and you want to study human sexuality, you're pretty much just studying about sex a lot. Well, actually, I'm studying for a math test right now, so it's <laughs> nothing quite so exciting as that. Um, hey, don't but... sell math short. Don't sell math short. <laughs> Math is not sex. <laughs> yes. Um, Correct. Correct. But I think I, I learned that in high school. <laughs> um, I won't be getting to that area of study, like actually getting to study it for years, probably down the road. So I'm going to do all like you know the more tedious stuff of math and science, and well, not, not the science is tedious because it's not, but math. I'm I'm not a math person, so I have to really put a lot of effort into it. So. I've been doing a lot of math. Uh, just to interject here really quick, 1978-79, uh, it was a 13-part documentary series. I for win. Cosmos. I, I guess 79, so so I was good. I win. But I watch it, like, all the time. Did I, did I bring up when I was so drunk, after I drink, you drink, and I couldn't keep my eyes open because the room was spinning, and I didn't want to shut them because the room was spinning, that what I did to calm myself down was I crawled into bed and turned on Cosmos. So, like, watching the original Cosmos series is like your whoopee. It is. It is indeed. <laughs> <laughs> um, as far as what's been taking up my time, I had the last nine days off before today. Uh, so, again, just a lot of different stuff, you know, spending time with friends and family and um, things like that. And the last two days have been like, oh, crap, i got to work again soon. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's just been a variety of things. Nothing specific, you know, that's really been taking up my time. No specific video game or book or anything that's really been, you know, keeping me busy. I had a hard drive fail on me, as you both know. Yes. But I will be getting it replaced soon. So that took up a lot of my time trying to figure out what was going wrong with it. Um, it is I, true. I, yeah, yeah. Um, I am still playing XCOM. My son has started playing it, and I have to tell you this story because my son's adorable, and so it's worth telling. Uh, he's eight. Uh, he is about eight and a half, actually. His birthday's in April, so. But he started playing XCOM. And the, it, for anybody who's ever played even the original XCOM, even though the characters are, you know, they're not anything. There's nothing special about them. There, There's no... There's no like actual like character development or anything with any of the characters, um, but you play these games and those characters like end up meaning something to you because you invest a lot of time in them. Um, but my son is a very sensitive uh, child, and so things work his emotions very well. And this game really did because he was. Uh, going into a terror uh, where aliens were terrorizing a uh, city and they were trying to grab people and in this mission you have to send your guys in you have to save as many people as you can and kill as many, and kill the aliens to stop them from you know killing these humans it's just a terror attack they're trying to terrorize people well he sent in his squad um, and I, sometimes I've been playing, well, he's been playing, and I've been sitting in the room and kind of helping him with tactics a little bit, but I was not because I was at work, and half of his squad got wiped out. So three of his squad mem six squad members got wiped out, and, uh, and he was telling me about, about it, and he was so emotionally distraught, he actually started crying about it. <laughs> and so I had to explain to him, hey, but did you win, or did you have to retreat? And he said, no, 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 I won. You know, and I said, and he, and I said, well, how many people did you save? And he's like, I only saved like four. And I'm like, yeah, but th those four people, it matters. Like, you saved four people's lives, and those people who died, you'll remember them forever, and your people will go into those fights and fight for for those those three that died in the last battle. 
And that was the only way I could get him to feel like okay about what had happened because he was so upset about it. It was very cute. <laughs> I also picked up a Carl Sagan book at the library today, The Demon Haunted World, so I'm looking forward to reading that. So you like Carl Sagan? I do, a little bit, yeah. I'm always sad that I never got to meet him. I didn't realize how awesome, awesome he was until, you know, only five or six years ago, four or five, six years ago, and he was obviously already dead by then, so... I decided, hey, you know, maybe one of the best ways I could probably learn about the guy is to read some of the stuff he wrote. So there you go. Uh, moving on, tech we cannot live without. Um, I haven't done a lot of thinking about this one. Uh, just. Uh oh. Uh oh. Because mostly we came up with the topic. Oh. In... Uh oh. oh. You froze. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> I heard uh-oh, but it was after I had said, I haven't done a lot of thinking about the topic that the tech we can't live without. <laughs> and so I thought you were saying, uh-oh, like, oh, Justin didn't do in his homework this week. There's <laughs> always one of us, one of us who's completely unprepared. So, <laughs> so I'm just going to pass it over to somebody who is already more prepared, um, whoever talks next. Okay, well, my biggest problem is that I am a tech junkie. So I decided that I could get rid of my uh, Harmony remote control, and that's the only one that I can get rid of. No. Um, like, the first thing that pops into my mind when I think tech I can't live without now is my phone, because uh, it does so much, you know. It's, like, right there, you know. Uh, my Facebook and my texting, you know, to stay in contact with people. I get so much of my news from it using my, my Pulse app and, you know, news feed, whether it's tech, or just general news, sports news, humor, you know, so much I get from that. Like, if I'm going to go see a movie, all that information is right there. Like, it's my alarm clock. Um, you know, I can use it like I have, you know, a ton of music on there, so it's an iPod for me. Um, it's just, it seems like it does so much for me on a daily basis in so many different ways. Um, that, of all the things, that's probably my number one. Um... But then, you know, obviously, I could not do this podcast without this laptop, so I really appreciate this laptop, and I prefer not to live without, without that. Um, I watch a decent amount of TV. I got a pretty sweet setup with all the little gadgets I got hooked up to it, my Roku and my Chromecast and my Xbox and my PS3. And, um, you know, so a gaming system is important to me. I like to watch my TV. I guess there's a lot a lot of stuff that I can't live without. Um, but I could probably get rid of the um, Roku and the Chromecast and the PS3 and still be okay because I could use my phone for net Netflix and a lot of that stuff directly to my TV. Um, I have a tablet, and I like my tablet, but I could probably do without that, although I read on it, so that would be difficult. See, I'm a tech junkie, people, and there's, you know, I, I love my tech. I love my tech. I love my tech a lot. Um, but I, the number one would be my phone. Um, everything else I would need, you know, 10 to 15 years to decide if I'm ready to get rid of it or not. I don't know. What about you, Sequoia? What, what's the top of your uh, tech that you would not want to give up list? Um, well, first of all, I would say I'm probably not, at least not nearly as much of a tech junkie as you are. I would not classify myself as a tech junkie at all. You I'm, people are. I'm, I think I'm just far too hippie for that. Um, <laughs> I'm very sort of like, you know, a little bit, I try to be at least a little bit minimalistic in my living. Um, I love my laptop. I love my laptop so much. Um, I, just because, like, the phone, I feel like, at least my phone, because it's like, it's a pseudo-intellectual phone. It's not quite a smartphone. It's more like a pseudo-intellectual. So it does a lot. But I feel like I get more functionality out of my laptop in general. Like, I, I like that I can have different tabs open, and I like that I can, you know, I, I listen to music on it when I'm cooking or, you know, taking a shower, and it's there for me when I get home, and I watch my Netflix on it, and it's just sort of like my all-around, like, hub that when I'm home, my entire life revolves around a laptop. That's how I'm doing this right now. Um, that being said, 
I think like six months ago or something, I actually dropped my phone in the toilet which was really heartbreaking and I was without phone for like a day and it was really, it was way more frustrating than I had anticipated. Okay, hold on a second because I gotta stop this because this has always confused me. Okay. I understand how a guy could drop the phone <laughs> in the toilet. I really don't understand how a female can drop their phone in the toilet. I think that's sexist. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> that's sexist. I, um... I had my phone in my back pocket, and when I was adjusting my clothing, I'll say, it uh, just sort of came out the back pocket and fell right into the bowl. Uh, luckily, it was like the precursor. You know? <laughs> like, it could have been worse. But, um, <laughs> but it just uh. fell right in there, and I, like, it's one of those moments when you're like, do I have to get it out? Like, what? This is awful. This is just an awful moment in my life. <laughs> There's nothing that can be done about it. And I brought it into Sprint the next day, and I wasn't even. I was just gonna tell them it was water damage, and <laughs> and um, my friend ended up telling them that I had dropped it in the toilet. Well, <laughs> you know if. Like you said, it was the precursor. See, if it wasn't, if it was at the <laughs> other stage, then instead of having dropped in the toilet, you would have just lost your phone. So That's true. It's very true. Then, like, um, I don't know what happened. I just, I had it, and then I didn't. <laughs> and I've had so many phones go because of water damage. That was the first time I'd ever dropped one in the toilet, but I remember one time I had put one in my pocket, and then I decided to jump into a lake. And I didn't take my phone out of my pocket. And this was like a day after I had gotten it replaced because my phone before that had broken by itself. Wow. Yeah, that's that kind of stuff freaks me out. It's also one of those reasons that there has to be a rule. I know, like 10 years ago, it was funny to push your friends into a pool when they were fully clothed. You cannot do that anymore. That no. is like that is a that is a rule. If it isn't right now, it is. Like it now a yeah. anymore. You cannot push people into pools anymore with all their clothes on because of the fact that everybody carries technology on them that you have unless you're willing to buy them a new one. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the, the memory cards and stuff will be fine because those, I mean, you have to, like, beat them with a hammer to really break yeah. or load or load all of your video games for the last five years onto and then have them explode, basically. Freaking exactly. memory cards. Sounds like a story. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree. Unless you know where their phone is, yeah. you know, then... Yeah. Like you can always be like, "Hey, can I can I see your phone really fast?" Like, and then have somebody else push him in. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I feel I like if somebody, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I find that would be suspicious. It's hard yeah. to pull a prank with with such a, a an obvious precursor. That sounds like a challenge, actually, Sequoia. I think we should have a pool party, James. Well, no, because what you do okay. is you go, "Hey, we're gonna take a picture. Let's. Can you use your phone?" So you ask them to take out their phone, and then you go, oh, okay, like, you, I'm going to take a picture of you guys now, and then you take their phone, and then, like, the person who's going to take the picture of them pushes them in. See? You could totally do it. Now, this prank would work on anyone who is not in or going to watch this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so most people in the world are fine. Yep. I mean, like, we can do it on most people in the world. All, almost pretty much anybody. Yep, pretty much. Few members of our family, maybe. <laughs> You know, the close, our closest friends we won't be able to do this on. And then the people we do it on probably won't be our friends anymore. So there you go. How hot is the day? You know, maybe they wanted to go swimming and they were just, you know, they, they didn't want to be the first. So I did cut I, I did cut you off and we went off, off on this tangent. Sequoia, you were saying other uh, technology you cannot live without. Oh, well, the story, the whole reason I brought up dropping my phone in the toilet was because it was shockingly frustrating not having my phone for... Because I think I didn't have my phone for, like, two or three days or something like that because they had to send me a new one. Um, and it was shockingly frustrating not being able to be texted or called. Um, mostly because it's, like, I couldn't call my mom, which was upsetting. Because my mom doesn't have a Facebook. 
and she, like, I don't have a house phone or anything like that, so not, like, my cell phone being down, I could not contact my mother. <clears throat> I guess I could have emailed her, but that's really not the same, and she only emails at work. Like, the only thing my mom uses technology for is, like, solitaire on the computer, so she was pretty much, like, I couldn't contact her. Um, Dear mom, still don't have my phone. Love, Sequoia. <laughs> Um, other than that, though, I would say the only piece of tech that I really would not enjoy living without would be um, a coffee maker, which is still technology. I could do with I a less. I could do with a less technically techno, technologically advanced coffee maker, but I still could not live without a coffee maker um, and a crock pot. I really, really, I don't get to use it nearly as much now, but I feel like the crock pot is amazing. And I'd be very unhappy if I didn't have a crock pot. Yeah, I, I wouldn't want to be without my toaster. And then there's the like, I mean, if you want to get into like general stuff like that, refrigerator, no, not living without a refrigerator. Washer and dryer, no, not living without a washer and dryer. Central air, mm -hmm. today I'd be okay. For the last couple months, no, thank you. I could live without central air. I could, I could live without an air conditioner. Uh, we see. We'll see. Uh, I, I I grew up in a home without central air, and so once you know, like even when my wife and I four years ago were looking to buy a house, I was like, I don't even want to look at a house that doesn't have central air because if I like it, I'm gonna be pissed because it doesn't have central air, and I like yeah. the house. And I was like, so I don't even want to look at it. If it doesn't have central air, I don't even want to walk in the door. I don't want to drive by it on the street. Um, well, like I don't, we didn't have anything like central air or we didn't have central heating until I was like 16 years old at my parents' house. They, they um, don't have that kind of stuff in wigwams. They don't. I was, thinking, I was thinking a log cabin, but yeah. It actually, the house I grew up in was intended to be like a weekender's log cabin, um, and my parents just kind of like built it up as we went along to like make it strong enough to handle everyday hippie living. Um, but we had like a really old heater in the living room, and that was it. That a, a fireplace, and that was it for like any temperature control in the entire house until I was probably about fifteen or sixteen years old. Um, and I had central air when I lived in Hawaii, but I was outside so much that it felt like kind of a waste. So I almost never used it after a little while. But then like. I have central air on all the time here, so maybe it's just been so long that I've forgotten how much it sucks. <laughs> yeah, the first day, like, high 90s, low 100s. That's yeah. true. Illinois yeah. weather is, like, really crappy, too, so... See, now you guys kind of you guys kind of stole my thunder because you guys were going, you know, ultra high-tech, and I was thinking, oh, you know, I can't live without central air or my refrigerator, you know, the stove... You know, the, the ability to have frozen food that sits in my freezer, and when I'm ready to eat it, I just turn my stove on and put it in and come back 10, 15 minutes later, and I have a meal <laughs> ready for me, you know? <laughs> you know? Um, but, uh, um, yes, it's true that I couldn't, you know, couldn't live without my cell phone, but could I actually live without my cell phone? Yes. My wife and I had an in instant. We went out for breakfast this morning. Me, my wife, and my my kids. We went out to uh, to to eat. And while we were eating, because we were having breakfast, and I got um, uh, hot cakes or you know whatever flapjacks, pancakes, whatever you want to call them, because I wasn't really very hungry, so I just got that. And we were talking about it, and we were wondering, you know, who invented them. And I was thinking, you know, 10, 15 years ago, if I suddenly, while we were out, had the question. Who invented pancakes? I would have to either write it down or remember that I was wondering. Go to a library, or if I ha if I'm lucky enough to have an Encyclopedia at home or an Encyclopedia Britannica set at home, I could look it up, and maybe that information might be in there. And then it's really dependent upon whether or not how accurate that information is. I mean. It, I grew up with an Encyclopedia Britannica set when I was growing up, but it was like six or seven years old because you don't buy a new one of those every year. They are eight or nine hundred dollar sets. I don't even think they they might not even make them anymore because they're very expensive and nobody really buys them now that yeah. you have access to things like Wikipedia. I'll look that up right now. 
Thank you. <laughs> but I had my phone, and I could ask Google, and I could go to Wikipedia and find out that pancakes date back to, like, 800 B.C. I mean, we're talking quite a long time ago. The Greeks um, had them. They weren't quite the same thing that we, we have, but they were basically um, pan-fried um, cakes that they, that they made. Um, and so, I mean, that information wouldn't have been at hand. And so those are things that I really like. And, and sometimes I will say, we are living in the future. I mean, 15 years ago, that type of stuff didn't exist. The, the, the vast amount of knowledge that sits in my hand right here or access at least to the vast amount of knowledge is just unknown. I mean, no human being ever before had access to the kind of information that we have. And could I live without it? Yes, I could live. The things that I really don't believe I could live without are things like the advances in medical technology that exists today. Um, the fact that last November I had two of my wisdom teeth pulled and I only had to be uncomfortable for a week or so because I had pain pain medication that really numbed the pain. I didn't feel a thing during the actual surgery. Um, I felt perfectly fine and those are all that kind of medical technology didn't exist 50, 60 years ago. You had to just deal with it and those are the types of things. You know I had hernia surgery two and a half years ago and heck a hundred years ago I would probably have possibly died either from the surgery or from never having the surgery at all. So medical technology is the thing that I definitely cannot live without. Yeah, I mean, I think when it, if we're talking about truly not, you know, being able to live without, none of the things I mentioned are things that I couldn't live without. Like, in some ways it would be re a relief to not have, like, the interactivity that the smartphone, like, gives and forces upon us, you know what I mean? Like, I remember growing up, like, if you weren't home, no one could get a hold of you. If you were out and about, there's no getting a hold of someone who's not at home. You know, you just couldn't. You couldn't. And maybe you'd leave a message if they had an answering machine. And they'd get it when they got home. And that's it. But now there's like, you know, it's instant communication, you know. Hey, I got home. I go to our message group on Facebook. Hey, I'm home. When can we start the pre-show? Anytime. You were lying, Sequoia. You couldn't at any time. We were I on for like ready. an hour and a half maybe before she jumped on. No. Maybe two I hours. Was, I don't really know. I was not told that the pre-show had started then. That is not my fault. I was ready whenever. All right, listen, e guys. Either way. Either way. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> you know what? You know what I think Sequoia needs? I think Sequoia needs to buy some new jewelry. She does need to buy some new jewelry. And you know what? I was actually checking out their website earlier. And look at this. They have new leather craft jewelry. And a hand. And a hand. Well, that's that's as part of the video, which... Oh, okay. You, you know, but so whatever. That's not for sale? Yeah. Okay. I don't think so. I mean, that would be kind of macabre. It would. Yeah. That's but anyway... Point. They've got jewelry now um, that is on, like, leather bracelets and things like that. And look, at they've got all these fancy... Uh, I, I'm putting my hands up on the screen like I'm showing you, and you can see my hands, what I'm touching and looking at. But anyway, yeah, I'll do it with my pointer here. Look at all these nice, fancy leathers that you can have jewelry attached to. So that's really cool. It's nice to see that there's other stuff um, that they're kind of branching out. Oh, those are really pretty. Um, so, yeah, I mean... Really nice stuff, again, at stravamax.com. Strava These are jewelry that are made by the uh, wonderful young lady who made all of our graphics. Um, so it, check out the website. If you see stuff that you like, a lot of it is very affordable, um, and all of it is very nice. So there you go, uh, stravamax.com. Nice. There you go. Sorry, I turn yellow whenever my webcam comes back on because its white balance is awful. So, moving on to our next topic, 
we are talking about the TV show. I really hope, I would assume, that they're going to do it as a miniseries, much like they did back in the 70s, as we looked up, 78, 79, uh, for the, uh, the miniseries Cosmos, uh, which was written uh, and, uh, star- and starred, obviously, Carl Sagan. Um, I think he was a co-writer. I think there were other people involved, but, uh, but he is the, the main kind of face with it. <clears throat> he was an astrophysicist and philosopher and um, had a lot of great things to say and really, really, my perception is that he really loved humanity and really loved science and really wanted that information out there for people. He loved educating people about science. And the host for this new one is Neil deGrasse Tyson, who also loves science. He loves educating people about things. And I got the opportunity a week late, you know, granted I didn't run out and watch the the trailer right away, but I did watch the trailer on the new Cosmos show that is coming out in 2014. I loved it. I think I thought the trailer was amazing. I am I was already really looking forward to the show. I'm really, really looking forward to the show now. Anybody who's fa- friends with me on Facebook knows that like, I flailed. My wife was sitting next to me as I was like, oh my god. Because, for, uh, you know, I, like, I, I love the original. And in the original, there's this overarching theme in which Carl Sagan is um, flying through space in what he deems the ship of the imagination. Kind of silly, but you got to remember that it took place in, you know, they wrote this in the 70s and, you know, drugs. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> she so, might have also been trying to make it accessible to children. That's but... possible, too. But anyway, the I ship of the... I think that the was sh- another explanation. <laughs> <laughs> the ship of the imagination, uh, it was a like a dandelion uh, with all of its little dandelion seeds uh, off of it. Um, and there was that theme that kind of went or went over it, and he and he flew through space, and they talked about things and what it would be like to see these, and and it's you got to watch the show. But anyway, um, I was I was saying to my wife, I really really hope that in this one that they're doing that they keep that theme because I think it's a good it's a good homage to what the original theme was, and that's they showed like one of the first. Things is Neil deGrasse Tyson walking across this like deck of this ship that it even it's very similar in style in stylized to the um, the original ship's like deck that Carl Sagan sits within and that just it it made me very uh, mm, uh, happy. happy and and looking forward to it because they they could have done so many bad things with it and made it gross. And they didn't. They, it looks like it looks like they're doing wonderful things. And then they had this wonderful uh, part where they cut uh, from the original Cosmos, where Carl Sagan is holding in his hand dandelion seeds um, that he lets go in the wind. And then they have a uh, another C, another cut in which a CG, obviously digital um, dandelion seed, is floating through the air with. Neil deGrasse Tyson standing on a mountainside and he grabs the dandelion seed. And I thought that that was very, very sweet. Uh, I would assume that they're going to be using that in the opening for the TV show. Um, And I think that it's great. I I think that if Carl Sagan was alive today, he would be as excited about this show as um, I feel like I am. So... And the Wikipedia entrance does entry on it does say it's going to be 13 episodes, just like the original. Excellent. And in the original, they did brand. I mean, they start with a lot of the the like history of the cosmos. Um, you know, 14 billion years worth of cosmos cosmic evolution. What happened? You know, all of these things. And this is this is stuff that is at this point. It's 30 years old. I mean, more than 30 years old. Um, but a lot of it is very. Um, it's still true today, or very nearly true. Uh, and and the one that you can get on Netflix also has a uh, a ten year later addendum in which Carl Sagan addresses some things that have changed. 
um, in the last 10 years and some new data that they have. Um, but even that's almost, you know, that's 20 years old, even that, yeah. uh, that information. Um, so I'm really looking forward to a lot of the new information that they've got over the last two and three decades and them just distilling that information out there. And it's so much more than just about Cosmos because it's, it's about, about the Cosmos because it even talks about the human condition, um, where humans have evolved from. It talks about evolution. I mean, there's just so much science in those 13 episodes. I just, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Nice. And I guess Seth, Seth MacFarlane's got a lot to do with it. He's an executive producer. Oh, okay. And Seth uh, MacFarlane is, he did, he's Family the, Guy. Family Guy. And uh, did he do like American Dad and stuff like that too? Or I, I believe so. Yeah, I don't know if he's, I know he's at least like executive producer on stuff okay. like that. I don't know how much of that is truly like all his, but I, I don't really know. I never I watched the show enough to know. But interesting that He's not the first person you think to, you know, be pushing something like that. You know, not not that I say that it, you know, it surprises me that it would he would do that. Uh, it's just not like the, the first name that would pop into my head. Um, but interesting, I guess quarter two of next year is when it's supposed to debut. Uh, Going to be showing on Fox and the National Geographic Channel when it does come out, um, which is nice because being on Fox means that. Pretty much everyone who wants to will be able to see it. Um, yeah, yeah. Not not everyone's going to have Nat Geo um, to see it, but that'll be nice because it'll probably play more on Nat Geo on reruns and things like that because they got more elbow room for shows like that to play repeatedly than a major network like Fox. Either way, once it comes out on Blu-ray, I'll be buying it. So. Yeah, you're probably looking at like 2015 for that. I would guess. Well, I mean, 13 episodes. I mean, if they come out every week, then yeah, by the end of 2014, it'll be done. So you're probably looking at somewhere in 2015. Unless they just try to, like, run it pretty quick right into Blu-ray. Yeah, I mean, they did that with stuff like Earth, um, with Life. I mean, obviously, those are Discovery Channel show uh, uh, miniseries, but those came to DVD and Blu-ray relatively quickly. Um, they pretty much lined them up. Okay, here's the last episode. Next week you can get the Blu-ray and DVD. Um, but yeah, and it makes sense keeping the momentum. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because uh, all the advertising you put in, you want to get the most out of it. And people still enthralled with it will be out there. You know, paying the money for the Blu-ray. This smart business. I and hopefully it makes like science is cool, but hopefully it makes science like pop culture cool again. And, I mean, I think in some ways it is, but normally right now that is limited to tech. Tech yeah. is the thing that is cool science right now. You know? Yeah. You know? um, that's the thing that kids are into, I guess, if you want to put it in a way. Um, it is kind of the main, the main thing um, that's really popularized as far as science. Um, I think other stuff is... Consider can be considered me a lot of the times, uh, depending. Um, but either way, I'm interested. I mean, just your excitement on it gets me excited, Justin. So that's good. Um, it, it it should be fun. It should be fun. So I'm guessing we have a couple articles here today as well. Uh, we do. I have a few, but um, I just talked for a long time. So well, let's let Sequoia kick off our articles. Uh, okay, so the first one that I found is actually, like, really disgusting. Um, Even better. There I'll, was... I'll start off next. Okay, fine. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so they found a 15-ton blob of fat growing in a sewer underneath London. Uh, it's been called the Fatberg. Nice. And it's as large as a double-decker bus. And it was mixed with thousands of used baby wipes. Um, I'm not really sure there's a lot to talk about with this, except that it's, like, completely disgusting. Um, this is why I get really mad when I see people pouring grease down their drains. Because it builds up, and it's gross. And that's how this thing was formed, is people, like, pouring, like, fat from, like, food they've made, like, bacon grease and crap, down their drain. I don't care if you have a garbage disposal, it's wrong. 
it 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 would it would depend on the grease because some greases are liquid at room temperature and other greases are a solid at room temperature. For example, many vegetable oils are liquid yes. at room temperature. Yes. Um, but most but most animal fat and and greases are a solid at room temperature. Yeah, like bacon fat should never go down your drain. Ever. Yeah. And that goes into your arteries, too. <laughs> yeah, true story. Like, I, I will say that, like, because my roommate is allergic to pork, so I almost never make bacon anymore because I'm not going to make bacon for just myself and then have to, like, you know, do stuff with the grease and, like, clean the pan for, like, two slices of bacon. So that's not something I do anymore, and I feel like I'm healthier overall <laughs> because of it. <laughs> Although bacon is delicious. It is delicious. I, I get it often when I go out for breakfast. So, okay, my uh, first article is there the fir for the first time you can actually, it's only in pre-orders right now, but it's called the Virtual Reality Omnidirectional Treadmill. Um, like anyone who's ever seen a virtual reality movie, um, either they're like hanging free in space or they're walking on some you know, treadmill that can go in any direction, and that's exactly what this thing is. Now, it does cost $500, but yeah, it's supposed jump to be, change. Yeah, it, you're supposed to be able to use it with certain games, uh, mainly with a PC right now, but they expect it to, you know, be able to use with next-gen systems and things like that. Um, so it is a big step. I mean, $500 is a lot of money, uh, but it's a big step to bringing virtual reality into a home, you know? Uh, you combine that with, like, the right kind of headpiece for, like, the visuals, and all of a sudden you could be playing, you know, WoW, where you're literally, like, walking around the world, um, you know, in your own living room or whatever room you choose to put, you know, a device such as that in. Um, so for a gamer like me, it's kind of an exciting step. Would I pay five hundred dollars or something like that? That has like minimal game support at the moment. No way. But you know, five years down the line, where you know it's it's really fully integrated into like gaming platforms, and it's something you could really, you know, like if I could play Skyrim, where you're literally like walking around a three D world, you know, that might be worth you know putting pinching pennies for a little while to you know spend the five hundred dollars on and get it set up in that den. And, I mean, it might be really hard to stop playing Skyrim, um, but it's already really hard to stop playing Skyrim, so what's the difference? <laughs> might be less hard after you have to walk around uh, Skyrim for a while. It's true, but, you know, that'd be good, actually, though, that, you know, adding in, you know, although walking would make it a pretty, you know, minor... Um, you know, exercise, still, you know, it, that'd be good to add that in. I think I, would, I think I would rather rent it. I don't think I would want to, like, it feels, it feels like, at least at the time, it's, it, it'll be a little gimmicky, you'd get it, you'd play a couple of games, and then it would end up collecting dust for a while. Yeah, that's why, like I said, I mean, I'd want to wait a couple of years before I would be willing to make an investment like that. You know, to make sure, you know, because they'll work the kinks out. It'll be, you know, the omnidirectional treadmill version 4.7 or whatever. Um, and, you know, more game support. You know, it could be a lot, a lot of fun. Even if they had it, you know, at arcades where you could go and do Oh, that. yeah, that would be kind of cool. You know, it, it could definitely, it's a lot of interesting uh, aspects for future gaming. That's something like that being commercially available. Uh, really do, you know, do you know how it works? Like you said, you can like strafe and walk and. There are special shoes you have to wear. Okay. That interact with the surface you're on a little better. But yeah, you can strafe side to side, move forward, backwards, uh, whatever it is, and the surface responds like you're moving, so you feel like you're walking forward or walking side to side or whatever it is. Huh. Um, so yeah, something about the the. Um, soles of the shoes and that surface interact together uh, to make it work properly. So you can't just jump on there and you're 
your vans or your Birkenstocks and just be running along. All right. So what about, what about you, Justin? What do you got for us today? All right. So the one website that I uh, that I like to go to uh, is a website. Flywhitefanfic.com. Sorry. <laughs> No, no, it's uh, it's a uh, one run by like the popular science uh, magazines that used to be very popular, at least as I recall, when oh, I was yeah. younger. Um, still, I th I'm fairly certain they still do them, um, but obviously they have all of, a lot of articles online where they have all sorts of sciency stuff and technology stuff that they they talk about. Some of it is like, hey, this is stuff that's coming out, and then some of it's like. Hey, if you were ever wondering about this, and so this was one that I thought was kind of interesting that I found uh, during the pre-show. So I was like, "Ah, we'll talk about it." Um, so if, and I'm sure everybody's always wondered about this, if you ever fell through the Earth to the center, and ignoring the fact that it's 9,000 degrees, uh, you know, it's as hot or hotter than the surface of the sun, ignoring the fact that there would be you know, thousands of tons of pressure uh, of, you know, massive amounts of miles and miles of air and everything else on top of you, ignoring all of that, what would it be like? Uh, and so what it would, according to this article, what it would be like is if you were in the center of the Earth, you would be weightless because all of the mass around you would be pulling you equally, in generally equally, in all the same directions because... Um, well, maybe not a lot of people understand this, but gravity works because all ma objects, all matter, uh, pulls towards itself, pulls towards other pieces of matter. And the larger, more massive an object, the more pull it has. And that's why we have gravity on the Earth, because it's a very massive, gigantic object, and it's pulling us towards it. For example, if you take a ball or a cup or whatever and you drop it, it falls to the earth. But what you cannot, what you don't see, and what's very, very difficult to to, to detect, is that the earth itself actually moves very, very slightly towards that object as well, because that's the way gravity works. Um, so if you're in the center of the earth, everything is pulling equally on you. You would be weightless. If you then had a really long ladder and started to climb it to get out. Um, as you would climb away from the center of the Earth, you would feel less and less and less and less weightless. You would feel heavier and heavier until you arrived on the surface of the planet in which you would be back to your normal weight. So there you go. So that means that Hollywood people are going to start the center of the Earth diet? Yes. I uh, was a couple thousand feet down, and I only weighed four pounds. <laughs> So there you go. Excellent. Okay. Any more articles, Sequoia? Um, yes. Uh, so they have um, implanted false memories in mice. Um, they've been able to sort of like tinker with certain like um, memory uh, triggers in mice to give them false memories. And the only reason I brought this up is because it reminded me of the study that I read a few years ago where they, um, it does seem mean. It does seem mean. Poor mice. Yes. It's very not heavy of me right now. <laughs> um, what, what kind of memories did they implant? They could be really nice memories. <laughs> they implanted fear <laughs> memories. Um, did they? <laughs> yeah, they did. Oh, <laughs> But I, you know, the thing is that they actually, like, first of all, any memory, like, stuff that they do is actually kind of mean, if you think about it. Like, tricking you into having a memory that's not real is pretty mean. What they actually did, like, a few years ago was they implanted a memory. Uh, well, what they do with people is they um, came up with a, um, a photo of uh, somebody, like, in a, uh, like, they had their family members give them photos of them from when they were younger and they photoshopped them into a hot air balloon and then they asked all of the uh, like participants to look at this photo that was completely created and they came up with a memory around it like people who had never been in a hot air balloon came up with memories about it so it's just sort of like more testing that they're doing on the memory which is completely faulty and awful and easy to hack into that kind of depresses me because I have a picture 
from when I was like one or two of me sitting next to this red garbage can that I had tipped over. And my earliest memory is of me looking at the garbage can and wondering what was in it and tipping it over. And now, now you're telling me that that could be completely falsified. You think that's messed up? This is the first podcast we ever recorded, Justin. <laughs> Don't mess with me like that. No. But at least they weren't implanting fear memories into. That's they were, true. They weren't being I think, mice. I th yeah, just in the point, mice. It, it may be a little unethical to implant fear memories into humans. Just assuming. It's not as bad as the article that I had read. I don't have this one, and it's not one of mine, and I know I'm going out of turn here. But they were doing studies on... Um, they were putting electrodes onto the brains of mice and then injecting them with a... Um, doesn't matter what it was, but it stopped their heart and killed them. And as, as they were dying, they were rec recording what was going on in the brain. Um, and it was for about, you know, 30 seconds or so after the heart had actually stopped, there was still, um, when the brain, supposedly the brain activity had gotten to the point where it was supposed to, what they clinically call death when the heart stops, there was still brain activity going on in some of the deepest reaches of the brain, and that's what they're, they're saying, that that's very likely, that it's possible, I mean, I don't know. Um, I can't remember the specifics on how they worded it, but they were theorizing that that may be where the concept of where we get our um, uh, near-death experiences from our, you know, oh, I saw all my family, oh, I was in heaven, oh, I had this hell experience, or, you know, I saw a tunnel, blah, 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 blah. So, obviously, they're not going to do tests like that on humans, hopefully, obviously, um, but, yeah, so there you go. Not that we'll ever read about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay. Uh, my other article is about um, key features that are expected to be in the future of smartphones. Uh, the first one, and you can get this a little bit, um, I think it's an app called Lair, L-A-Y-A-R, um, but augmented reality, where you look at the camera of your phone and it'll point out all sorts of information about like what it's seeing. And you can do this in you know some areas that are well known, like you can do this in areas of Chicago and things like that. Um, but right now it's, um, it's fairly limited, but they're expecting that to expand. Um, flexible screens, where like you can really kind of bend and manipulate your phone a lot more. Um, Built-in projectors, so you can just project photos um, and other things right onto a surface. More seamless voice control. We all know we have voice control in a lot of these smartphones now, but it's very hinky. Um, but really taking that to the next level of being Star Trek-like. And then 3D screens and possibly holograms um, that might eventually make it into our smartphones, which could be uh, pretty interesting. I think all those are interesting and short of you know holographic phones I feel like all of them are they're there um, the technology is there um, we're just not quite that far along yet um, but even the flexible screens I know I don't remember the company um, but they actually just put out um, a bounty for Samsung actually um, for their bendable screens uh, for someone to come up with good product uses for it. Um, and, you know, someone is going to be able to win tens of thousands of dollars if they can come up with the right thing. I mean, definitely do some research into what exactly it is, if you have any ideas for that. Um, but, you know, that flexible screen is already there. You know, and all the other ones, you know, like I said, there's an app for that, augmented reality, and we have Siri in our iPhones and other things like that in pretty much all our smartphones for the voice recognition. So, all pretty interesting. I remember um, in the sci-fi movie that came out in the late 90s, possibly early aughts, uh, by, it was called uh, Red Planet. 
okay, floor or yeah. something like that. Um, they had screens that they pulled apart, and it used that same type of idea of the augmented reality, where they they used it where they pulled it apart, and it was scanning the horizon of Mars, and they were trying to find a location that they were trying to get to, and on the screen it showed like a dotted line where how they should go across the where they were going and all of these things and um, and I remember my brother and I talking about how that's technology that's coming um, and so yeah I mean if they kind of implemented the augmented reality in, uh, with smartphones and then along with like Google Glass um, uh, with like the glasses I mean you were talking about the holograms but if you have augmented reality on the glasses um, you wouldn't need a hologram you would just have an augmented reality you know, whatever, butler or something that stands in front of you go, oh, yes, let me give you your messages for the day. <laughs> you know. Yeah, but that would be, because the augmented reality would be, you know, looking through the Google glasses and, you know, looking down the street and seeing, you know, like a little cafe and then, you know, being able to interact with that image to get, like, Yelp reviews, as an example, of that okay. cafe displayed yeah, sure. right there you know, or other information, you know, um, like a movie theater there and, like, the next three showings and, like, you know, being able to click on it on your phone and, like, literally buy tickets as you're walking towards it, you know, things like that. Um, but the holograms would be a different thing. I mean, you could add both of those on. Yeah. You know, like that, combining all those together, you could be, like, looking through your phone with the augmented reality, have the hologram of the butler, and then tell them, like, oh, yeah, I want to buy tickets for that, you know, 4.30 showing of, you know, whatever, Saw 83, you know, whatever whatever one is next in line. Um, you know, and have all that integrate, you know. You combine that with Google Glasses and the phone's still in your pocket. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, it's amazing the potential of what we could be seeing in five years or ten years. I mean, we're already living in the future when it comes to our technology. It's already amazing, you know, beyond belief. If we didn't have it in our pockets every day, it would be amazing beyond belief. You know yeah. what I mean? But since it's been, like, incremental and step-by-step, step, like, it becomes kind of, you know, normal just because it, it's right there for us. But, I mean, especially, you know, I'm a little older than you guys, so, like, I remember like houses with one phone and it was probably rotary dial and having an answering machine was like a luxury you know and you had like five TV channels I could get more content streaming to my phone like in a single day than I had access to in like weeks at home you know years maybe just because it was what was on at that moment and that's it and now it's on demand and DVRs and Netflix and things like that but, I mean, anyways, it's just, it's exciting to see what the likely future of technology we're already dealing with now is. There's a, a joke going around the internet that I've seen that was like, um, if you ran into somebody from the 1950s, what would you say to them about living now? Or what would be the hardest thing to explain to them about living now? And it was something that somebody had answered, and they were like, you know, that I have something in my pocket that enables me to find out information about almost anything in the entire world, and I use it to look at funny pictures of cats. <laughs> yeah, I think I've seen that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I think uh, we're coming up on about an hour here, so I wanted to uh, end with, and I don't know if you guys can read this, but this is one of my... Uh, most favorite quotes of Carl Sagan's, um, and the picture that is being portrayed behind the quote uh, was a picture that um, was imaged. It's it says on the on the on the bottom of the picture here that this is a picture of Vo that was taken by Voyager One uh, as it exited our solar system in 1990. Um, the Earth is nearly four billion miles away in the image. And that arrow is pointing to a tiny, and you might not even be able to see it uh, with the quality that it, this records at, but that tiny little dot, maybe a pixel size or a uh, little bigger than, um, is the Earth. And it's caught in, in this picture, it's caught in what looks like a sunbeam. Uh, and this is, this is his quote. It's one of my favorite quotes of his. Um, and it says, 
look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and every sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. And I think that's a good place to just stop. Thank you guys for watching. We will see you next week. Uh, remember to like the video, share it if it's something you're interested in, so you think there are other people who would be interested in it. Email us, uh, friend us, friend us on Facebook, like us, like the Facebook group, and comment. Thanks, guys.